Hi, I'm, uh, my name is Ben Barrett. I'm the owner here at Berkshire Veneer Company in Egremont, Massachusetts. And I started the company back in 1996 after about a nine-year tour with a veneer company who was producing veneers. Um, I broke off from them and moved back home again uh, and started the started Berkshire Veneer in the old kiln building up in, in the front of the property here. After a number of years, I went to the bank to borrow money to build the building that we're in here presently. This is my warehouse here. It's a 10,000 foot building. Uh, the offices are 2,500 feet, so the whole building is 12,500 feet total. We got a, uh, an electric forklift, which was an absolute home run. I can't recommend an electric forklift enough. No fumes, no warm-up, no maintenance. Just got to add water to the batteries. And that was the best 5,000-pound forklift investment I have ever made. Uh, the pine box has two 1,000-gallon propane tanks in there full of water as a heat sink. When the zone calls for heat in the floor, it pulls off that, that 2,000 gallons of water. I don't know how many dollars I saved by burning wood rather than oil, but I also spent the bulk of my life cutting, splitting, stacking, orchestrating firewood. Um, what I'd like to do now is, is talk about the different styles of production of veneer. Um, I wrote in an article for Fine Woodworking back in August of 2010, issue number 213, an article about the production of veneer and how veneers are actually made. Very simple, plain sliced walnut, the most common production style is plain sliced. You can book match the leaves on out. This is a, this is a rift walnut or quartered walnut very linear straight grain. The oaks are cut oftentimes on, a, on a, a rift basis like this, much like the walnut, very linear straight grain without any medullary flake. As a, these are quartered white oaks and where that nice medullary flake showing, medullary flake, some people pronounce it. Quartered figured maple, this is a fiddleback quartered maple, pretty nice example of a quartered fiddleback maple there. Usually what folks do is they slip match rift and quarters like this, or rift at least, and therefore you've got a more monochromatic color. When you, when you book match them, you're reversing sort of the cellular structure and you get an AB positive negative sort of, they call it barber polling in the industry where it's like dark, each panel that you book match over is One's lighter and one's darker. This is a little bit more dramatic example of it. This is a madrone burl. Take two pieces, one, two, three, four. You can match them like this. It's kind of a fun, fun effect there. Some people would call this a defect. I would call it a, an attribute. So we made pie shapes out of that and then took 12 pieces and, and matched them around and came up with that tabletop. It's a three foot diameter tabletop that I thought was so pretty we should use it as a piece of art. Before you even start cutting any veneer is if you wanted to do a radial match, you can find by taking these mirrors, they're just taped together on the ends. If you wanted to add in, add in some different effects, and then you can mark it out with a pencil, and then you know you know where you want to cut through all your uh, all your veneers. Some guys have it marked out with a with a spacer that holds that locks in. It's it's curved, so a piece of wood sits on it. It's locked in, and they can they know exactly where they need to be. The veneer world is all metric. Um, all the machinery, all the measurements and tallies and everything is all done in metric. So it's really good. You might want a metric tape measure for conversion if you're working. I guess it may or may not matter, but just be aware that, that, that the veneer world is all in metric. This is a veneer saw for cutting on the pull stroke. You, you would put your straight edge on. I didn't bring a straight edge. I can just use this. You put that on your veneer and you draw it towards yourself a few times. It's, it's, it's uh, set off one side so it only cuts. When you do cut down through that, 
you have a waist side that's got the, the kerf on it, and the other side is a 90 degree, so you have to be careful about, you can't join those two edges that are where the kerf is, they'll never meet. So you always want to use the 90 degree side. Uh, veneer tape, this is a so happens to be a solid veneer tape. There's perforated as well, it's dealer's choice. Uh, you run this over a, a, a moistener or a sponge and it activates the, you can see the on this piece here, they used a solid piece on the edge here that's perforated. You just have a little less scraping to do. This is um, not a good way to cut veneer. All this does is, is plows through the wood and parts it. It doesn't actually cut it and it'll be likely to, to follow the grain of the wood rather than where you want it to go. Let's talk about cores and the different options that are available today. Um, these are just looking at the end, obviously, end view. The bottom one is, is a particle board. And then above that is a MDF, medium density fiber board. And then this is just a veneer core. And then this is a bit of a hybrid. This is a, this is a I think the trade name is Pluma Ply or Armor Core. And what it is, it's a, it's a veneer core with a HDF on the top. Particle board, one of my highest end woodworkers use, only uses particle board on his panels because the, the coarseness of the core allows the glue to really bite. The, the MDF is so smooth, as is the HDF here, that the glue may or may not wick in and get a bite. Um, the uh, veneer core is not as stable as are these are omnidirectional. There's no, there's no. This is this is they're real wood, but they're ground up and and have glue, so much glue in them that they're not so subjected to uh, changes in, in uh, humidity as much as veneer core is or plume apply. Uh, these don't hold screws. These do hold screws. These hold screws, but they're not as stable as are these. Um, these are heavy and like really heavy. So that's an, that's a, a, can be considered a negative. There's an, uh, there's an ultra light MDF. That's, I don't know how they do it, but it's a little bit, it's not as heavy as conventional MDF. We had uh, a thin quarter inch MDF. We put a figured maple on the face. We put a plain maple on the back, same species, same thickness different cuts and that that burl side of it really pulled hard so the moral of the story is ideally same species same cut same thickness on both sides of the panel and then you will have done and then put five coats of finish on this face but five coats of finish on this face and you'll have an exactly perfectly balanced panel Let's talk, let's talk now about glue and the different options for glues. In my world, there are basically two types of glues. There's PVA glue and urea formaldehyde glue. PVA glue, tight bond, woodworking glues of that caliber, never cure hard, rigidly. They, are, they always allow the veneer to move, to creep a ever so slightly. If you lay out a dollop of urea formaldehyde glue, which does cure hard, and a, and a dollop of PVA glue, and let them kick, and you peel it off of the, the wax paper and hit the edge of the table on it, the PVA glue goes thud, and it just like a, like a spatula. And the urea formaldehyde glue, because it dries rigidly, it shatters. And it locks the veneer down. When you use crotches and burls and, and oily woods, things like that, you really want to use a urea glue because it, it locks everything down really, really hard, where the PVA glue will allow the, the veneer to creep on you. One other option that I neglected, neglected to mention on the glue topic is hide glue, which is um, traditional... Um, it's reversible. One of the benefits is that it's reversible. A lot of antique furniture is done with it. And um, it's heated up in a, in a glue pot and you paint it onto the substrates and then you, you 
take what of what's called a veneer hammer. You can see this guy's doing it here. You draw the hammer across the veneer in totality, and that kicks the glue. And uh, that's another style of, of veneering that's done. What I'd like to do now is talk about uh, flattening of buckled veneer. You can see this, uh, this particular piece of crotch is very buckled. This is, um, this is a little bottle that I bought at the pharmacy of glycerin. You have to ask for it behind the counter. I don't know why, but it's a, it's a hand emollient. Denatured alcohol and 80% water. So the, this, is my, this is my recipe, 80-10-10. 80% water, 10% glycerin, 10% denatured alcohol. The denatured alcohol helps the water flash off and the glycerin remains behind and it, and it makes the uh, veneer malleable. So here's the, here's the potato chip. It's going to go snap like that. And here's the, treat, the piece that I treated. It's still wet, but you could almost tie this into a bow tie if you wanted to, compared to these buckled pieces. What I like to do is put down a piece of plastic, because what we're going to do is spritz this down, front and back. You're, putting, you're adding water back into the veneer by doing this, obviously. And what you have to do is get that water back out. And because it, the water sort of beads up on the veneer, I like to paint it in like this with a clean brush. And you put down a piece of craft paper. Like this. And go to your next, your next leaf. But you, you invert them against each other so that you're not just nesting the veneers right back together again, right the way they already are buckled. So you swap them end for end, back and forth. So now the, buck, the high spots work the other high spots down. Change the paper out every day. I'm, I'm cheap, so I take these craft papers and, and hang them up like clothes, like laundry, let them dry, and then swap them out the next day, and renders the veneer malleable. Like, it's almost like leather. It's pretty remarkable. Okay, so there's leaf number one is down, going east-west. Leaf number two goes west-east, and so on. And then I wrap it up like this, and... I put a weight on it like this for, put a little bit of weight on it. You don't want to shatter it. So the first day, the first few hours, you leave it with just a, a brick, say. And then the next day you come back and you take it out and change the paper and you put a cinder block on there. You increase the weight so you bring it down slowly and then bang, you've got a, you've got a finished, ready to rock and roll piece of veneer that was a potato chip and it's now user friendly. If you have a straight edge, a saw, tape, and, and glue, and, sub, and veneer and substrate, you're in business. It does, it's quiet. It's a joy to, to produce veneer pieces because it's quiet and uh, doesn't take a lot of sophisticated machinery. enjoyed working with a lot of fabulous people and working with the most beautiful wood in the whole world being surrounded by it every day I get a I get a roll of samples from a veneer mill would come in and you open it up and it would be figured maples and cherries and just extraordinary examples of mother nature's finest work and I was lucky enough to be able to have it for a while and sell it and, and uh, hopefully beautify this planet through gifted woodworkers who have been able to take it from raw format to finished product and installed and uh, it's been a real it's been a real pleasure and now I'm winding down it has been nothing but joy it really okay it's hard.
hard to call it a job because it's been such a pleasure. So I thank you for watching the video. Hope you enjoy it. Hope you, if you have any questions, reach out to me. Thank you for your attention and wish you the best.